Foster, Executive Director of the Collective Impact Forum, which is a partnership between FSG and the Aspen Institute. We are so delighted to have you here with us today. Thanks for joining. Before we start, we wanna take a moment to recognize the land that we are on. We would like to acknowledge that this virtual coffee is presented and recorded on the traditional land of the Ohlone people, the Wakamasiuan people, the Coast Salish people, and the Duwamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Ohlone, Wakamasiuan, Coast Salish, and Duwamish people. Thank you. So uh, before we dive into our conversation with our guests, Joelle and Hallie, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes orienting you to the session. Our conversation today will run for 60 minutes and feel free to grab a literal cup of coffee or tea uh, as we sit down to chat. This virtual coffee series is intentionally set up to be a casual learning experience where we get to hear from experts in the field about their work. We plan to spend a little bit over half of our time hearing from Hallie and Joelle, and then we'll turn to questions for the back half of our presentation. Uh, you can put questions in the question box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll sort through them and try to get to as many as time allows. In addition, the session is being recorded and we'll make the recording available later on today. Please keep an eye out for an email announcing when the recording is up on the Collective Impact Forum website and we'll link to it in the email that we send you. Uh, one note in addition about handouts. You can find a hard copy, or I should say an electric copy for download of today's presentation and several other references in the handouts tab in this webinar platform. So you can download those while the webinar is happening and we'll include links to both the slides and other resources when we email you after today's session. If you're having technical difficulty, you can ask for assistance in the question box on the right or email info at collectiveimpactforum.org. Let's go to the next slide. So here again, info at collectiveimpactforum.org and please do use the, uh, the uh, question box to communicate with us. So I am so delighted today to introduce my colleagues, Joelle Cook and Hallie Preskill. Hallie is a managing director with FSG and co-leads FSG's strategic learning and evaluation practice with Joelle. Hallie has spent more than four decades in the evaluation field and has always viewed evaluation as a catalyst for learning. She's been an educator, trainer, and facilitator on evaluation and has written widely on the topic of evaluation and learning. And she promises she's so excited to be with us uh, participating in this virtual coffee today. Joelle Cook is a director with FSG. She's worked with a variety of clients over the years, supporting evaluation and learning efforts. Prior to consulting, Joelle was a Peace Corps volunteer, a researcher, a staff assistant for two members of Congress, and spent a summer working on archeological dig. Joelle is based in FSG Seattle office, the perfect place for a coffee chat. So with that, I am pleased to pass the baton over to Hallie and Joelle. Hi everyone, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. This is Hallie Preskill speaking. Um, I can't believe we had 4,100 people sign up for this coffee chat. And when Tracy um, and Jen and Robert asked us if we, Joelle and I would be interested in having a coffee chat with you, I always thought, sure, maybe 10, 20, 30 people might show up and we just sit around having a cup of coffee chatting. Uh, real informal. And as word got out and we heard people were super interested in this topic, it looks like we're over 4,100 in registrants. So that is to say thank you um, for joining us today. And even if you're hearing this recording and would, couldn't participate virtually today, uh, we're really excited that you're excited about this topic. Uh, Joelle and I have been thinking about evaluating systems change and dabbling in it for many years now. Um, and reading widely on it and writing a little bit about it. So we're just super excited that others are, are picking, uh, picking up on this as well. Um, so next slide, please. Um, if you know, in the beginning of the new registration process, you were asked if there were any questions you'd like answered today. And uh, these are just a minuscule number of the questions that you posed. There were hundreds and hundreds of questions that you posed. And as you can see, um, they are quite varied. 
uh, and com some of them pretty complex, things like what kind of evaluation issues should I consider? Uh, how do we track things in multiple years? Um, how do you evaluate unintended consequences? What about the influence of media? And it goes on. So there's just a whole wide variety of questions that you pose. And what, while we deeply appreciate um, your thoughtfulness and, and taking the time to pose those, you'll see we will have, um, we have tried to incorporate several of these questions into our presentation. And we'll have time after our presentation to have more of that coffee chat back and forth Q&A with you as well. Um, so uh, let's kind of look at setting expectations around this webinar. Next slide, please. Um, so the big takeaway here in the, is at the bottom, actually, that we really don't have all the answers. As I said, Joelle and I have been dabbling in this content for a while, but it is really emergent and um, is new, and we are all still learning. So along with you, we are um, have lots of questions, and we don't have all the answers, and of course, there are no simple answers, and systems change work no matter what. So if you kind of you know give us the benefit of the doubt for a minute, um, and so what we won't be talking about, again, I think because you raised so many great questions, we wanted to be clear about what we are going to cover today. Um, this is not a master class in evaluating systems change. There is no way we could cover everything one could cover in such a class. Um, so we're going to you know, really try to provide some guidance and some resources for you to think about and use in your practice. But it, you're not going to know everything there is to know because we don't know that. Um, also, as I said, no definitive answers or simple solutions to the questions. Um, and so we apologize in advance if your question doesn't get answered or not to the depth that you would, would like, uh, but hopefully you'll get something out of this uh, time together. And also, uh, some of your questions had to do around collective impact specifically. And we wanted to say this is not a webinar about evaluating collective impact. While most CI efforts are definitely system change efforts, seeking to change the conditions that hold problems in place and population level outcomes are often desired, this is not um, focused. This particular website, excuse me, webinar or coffee chat is really about um, evaluating systems change more generally. So what we will be talking about, um, some concepts and language of systems uh, thinking and change, just to ground ourselves. Um, the differences and similarities between evaluating programs and evaluating systems, because there are some differences, as you've probably picked up in your own practice and observations. Uh, we will be providing some guidelines for planning, implementing, and learning from system change evaluation. And we've put uh, together, compiled a set of resources for you on systems change and evaluating systems change that are in the appendices, our appendix of the uh, slides that you'll have access to after our webinar, after our coffee chat. And um, we will make time for questions um, as you pose them um, throughout the webinar um, and some of the questions that you posed um, in, in the registration process. We have a wonderful uh, colleague, Aditi Lumine, who is actually our, what we call our question wrangler. So as you pose questions in the question box, she will be tracking them and she will be selecting some of them to ask um, of uh, Joelle and I to answer after we do our presentation. Um, so again, our hope is that you have an understanding around what evaluating systems change is all about and um, that you can draw on some of the resources we provide as well, in addition to the five handouts that are in the box um, on your screen. So let's go ahead and start. Next slide, please. Um, again, some definitions. Really important to know that we're all on the same page when we're talking about systems change. Um, we provide three here systems. Uh, a commonly referred to definition is Interconnected set of elements that's coherently organized in a way that achieves something, so some function or purpose. So that the key here is things are connected. A key a, a fundamental aspect of systems is things are connected. Systems change. I think a lot of people have adopted this definition, shifting the conditions that are holding the problem in place. That is that there are things that are maintaining the status quo. There are certain conditions that are keeping that problem situated in the way it is. And we call it, you know, it's um, intractable. We talk about problems in a lot of ways that they just aren't moving. We're moving the needle, we're not moving the needle. So anyway, systems change is about changing those things, changing those conditions around the problem. And then systems thinking is really about seeing differently. It's defined as the ability to see how organizations, uh, organizational systems, subsystems, and their parts interact and influence each other and how these systems create and contribute to the specific problems. So I think about these three as that knowing that things are connected, that we're trying to change the status quo, 
and that we have to see things differently to be able to make those changes. Okay, next slide, please. Another way of thinking about systems um, are through this graphic here. And I like this because ultimately it illustrates that systems thinking requires a shift in mindset. We have to really change the lens or move, you know, change how we see things a bit um, from static programs with a beginning and end to something that's much more complex, away from linear to circular, um, and of course, reinforcing again that things are interconnected. System thinking is also based on the idea of emergence, the natural outcome of things coming together, and it suggests that outcomes are due to synergies um, among the parts. Now, I'm thinking about, think about evaluation pretty soon. The synergies among the parts that related to outcomes. So that means that the outcomes that you're looking for are not going to be independent and isolated. They're going to be in relationship to other kinds of changes that are happening. Um, and again, the change is nonlinear and is often uncontrollable and unpredictable, which makes us all really uncomfortable because who doesn't like certainty? Um, this graphic also speaks to the importance of synthesis, the idea that combining two or more things creates something new. And the goal in synthesis, as opposed to analysis, which is the dissection of complexity into manageable components, um, as a result, we need a holistic approach to understanding and evaluating change, which involves understanding the whole and the parts at the same time, along with the relationships and connections that make up the dynamics of the whole. And finally, since everything is interconnected, then it's really important to understand the, import, the, the role of feedback loops and flows within the elements of a system. We can observe, understand, and intervene in feedback loops once we understand the type and dynamics. Okay, next slide, please. So this, I bet, looks familiar to many of you. Um, I think we've seen reference to it. This. Uh, uh, for those of you who have read the Water of Systems Change uh, paper that FSC published in 2018, the inverted tri triangular um, is something you may have seen before. Um, and I want to just kind of, you know, raise this or show this again, because this is, a, I think, a really useful tool to thinking about the conditions around change that we try to affect through different kinds of programs, initiatives, um, and efforts in, in philanthropy, in our nonprofit sector, in our corporate sector. We have, we're trying to create some kinds of changes, right? Uh, and then government, of course. So the, the, one, the structural changes are the ones that we've kind of known for a long time. Those are the ones we've paid a lot of attention to. And they're, they're tangible, they're visible, and they're probably the easiest to measure and affect change in. Um, the next level, the relational change around power and relationships, we're just beginning to really understand what that looks like. Um, both from a systems change perspective um, and the nuances there, and then how we can evaluate those pieces. The transformative change is where we're really changing how people believe, what people believe, how they see the world through mental models, the schema, the ways they make sense of the world. Those are the harder things, A, to affect through systems change, but also to evaluate. But they're definitely valuable. We definitely have methods and approaches to really get at the mental models. Now, later on, Joelle will share with you how she's used this inverted pyramid, um, the fixed conditions of systems change, uh, to guide an evaluation effort. It's not the only tool or framework to use, but it has been useful because you're thinking, oh, well, if these are the things I'm trying to change, these would be the things we want to evaluate. Okay, so we'll be coming back to that. Okay, next slide. So let's move into evaluation. Okay, so what role does evaluation play? So I like definitions. Now, as many of you probably know, the evaluation field is full of jargon. The field has been about around almost 50 years, and every year we add new words just to confuse everyone, uh, but not with intention. Um, but this one, you know, to me, I think is fundamental, this definition that um, probably 99.9% .9 of all evaluators would ascribe to. Evaluation involves a systematic collection of relevant, credible, and useful information for making decisions and taking programmatic and strategic actions. So this is the, the key words here are systematic collection. So there's, it's planned and purposeful. And obviously any data that are collected must be credible and relevant if they're going to inform our, our decisions and actions. So then the purpose of evaluation, why do we do it? Um, ultimately it's about sense making, reality checking, assumption testing, and answering questions. 
And out of these, I would say the questions are always at the heart and the core of evaluation. What are the questions you want to have answered through any form of inquiry, especially in this case, evaluation? What, are, what do you need to know? Why do you need to know it? And who's going to use those results? And when we could actually make sense of things, where we can check our reality through collection of data, where we can actually test our assumptions, which we're always operating under, then evaluation can play a real role in learning from our, our successes as well as failures. And then I love this quote from Michael Q, uh, Quinn Patton, who is very, very well known, one of the founders, fathers, grandfathers, whatever, of our evaluation field. Um, and he, he said, uh, too many of us and who, those who commission us think that evaluation is all about methods. It's not, it's all about reasoning. And I love this quote because oftentimes people think about evaluation as, oh, let's do a survey or let's do an interview. That's a method for collecting information, but it's not really what evaluation is all about. It's about reasoning. It's about making sense of the world through data and through experiences that are credible, relevant, and timely. Okay, next slide, please. So let's think about some differences between evaluating programs and evaluating systems. Um, I love this graphic here, um, and here is a simple intervention. And over for many, many years, we we've really been driven in in in, non, in philanthropy and nonprofit sector to really think about programs to solve problems. And we've done a really great job of developing plans. We develop a vision and mission, and then between our plan and achieving our our, our you know long term impact, we have inputs might be resources, uh, you know financial resources, personnel resources, uh, physical resources. You know, we have a set of activities that we design and employ, and then we expect some kind of outputs, um, you know, kind of evidence that something has happened, that we've reached people or that people have attended or that money's been spent. And then we have these, you know, short and interim outcomes and the impact or the long-term outcomes. And the assumption has been that over time, and then of course these things are carried out over time, we've been guided by an assumption of linearity like if and causality, that if we do this, then we will get this. And it's like a pretty straight line. And that really it's about, you know, are, asking questions, are we efficient? Asking a, the question, are we effective? And we've really been focused on that. And we've done a lot of good evaluation work. We've provided a lot of useful information around programs and initiatives with this model. But we also have learned that individual programs by themselves are not going to affect systems change. And in reality, what the world really is like is next slide, please. And you can just, Robert, you can just click, 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 click. <laughs> this, is, this is our reality, folks, right? I hope you're smiling <laughs> um, or, you know, uh, nodding at least. So the reality is in today's complex world, you know, uh, and with an understanding of what it takes to affect systems change, um, the reality of any uh, initiative efforts more like this. It's not predictable. It's not linear. Um, and in systems change, one thing influences another thing. So when you change something, one part of the system, you're affecting changes in another, yet another part of the system. There are unintended consequences in addition to the intended consequences. Certain things take more time or less time. Some things are, you get, um, uh, you know, a quicker effect, but, you know, it, it's going to be small and, and not even sustainable. So there's lots of things happening in a system, which makes evaluation, you know, a little bit different than evaluating programs. Next slide, please. So let's talk about, you know, what's the same and what's different in evaluating programs and systems. When you're evaluating programs on the left side, what's the same is that we're always looking for what's identifying the purpose of an evaluation. And we're always doing it to make judgments about merit, worth, value, and significance. And I want to say evaluation is the, the key word is in evaluation is value. We are always making value judgments and evaluation is about judgment. Um, and again, about these different things about merit, worth, value, and significance. Evaluations always have stakeholders, and we talk about those stakeholders as intended users of the intended findings, um, or intended use by intended users, so that you're doing it for a client, or you're doing it for a decision making, you're doing it for a purpose. The process of evaluation is the same, regardless of program or a system. You plan it, you implement it, and you plan to use findings. But what's also the same is context is important, very important for evaluation. Of course, it's important to embed an equity lens. And we also want to make sure that regardless of program evaluation or systems change evaluation, we're making judgments, recommendations, or considerations and surfacing key learnings from the work. So those things are true for programs and systems change evaluation. 
But what's different with systems change evaluation is an increased focus on the range of system elements, the many things that could be affecting the potential change that you're looking for, and those six conditions. How structural inequities are influencing social issue and change processes, critically important when we look at the world and, and social change and what we're trying to affect. We are now increasingly recognizing how important it is to take a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens to look at those structural inequities and how those are showing up and influencing the degree to which and where and for whom that change is or is not happening. We're also focusing more on multiple influences of context and system elements. So many aspects of context, social, political, economic, cultural, uh, and so on. We're also focusing more on how systems are always changing and creating new patterns of interactions. So our length of the evaluation may be longer because we're going to try to be tracking some of these changes and how one change is affecting other changes in that system as it changes and reacts to, responds to the things that we're doing within that system. It's also a greater focus on the interrelationships of actors within that system. Because everything's interconnected, those relationships are critically important, as we learned from the six conditions of, social, um, of systems change as well. What also we're going to focus on more is the nature of judgment and the timeline for change. So criteria for what works, what success looks like. Um, we're going to probably have different criteria for success in a systems change effort than you would with a program that's more predictable. Um, we're also going to look at the, understand that systems change is long term and ultimately the outcomes may take years to shift. So that means what are some milestones we might look like, look for? What are some markers knowing that we may not see those long term outcomes in our lifetime or certainly within the, the span of a particular grant? Outcomes are often nonlinear and counterintuitive. The size of the outcome sometimes doesn't correlate with the size of the input. So what does that mean? And then finally, the need um, for we need to have data collection methods that go beyond the common ones or the traditional ones we've used um, to be able to capture some of these changes in the system, to, to capture in real time, to capture the nature of relationships, to ca capture the nature of power, um, and some of the other kinds of system shifts that we're looking for. So those are some of the things that are different. So you're probably wondering now, okay, how do I do it? What do I need to look at? You know, I get all that stuff, that conceptual, that grounding stuff. Well, now I'm gonna hand it over to Joelle who will share with you some of the guidelines we've put together based on a lot, a work, uh, a lot of the work of others that, again, are in references in the, in the slides later on. So, Joelle, over yeah. to you. Thanks, Hallie. Thank you. And thank you for already sharing our spoiler alert that uh, we are still learning, uh, right? The evaluation field and other evaluators like ourselves are still learning the best ways to do this. Um, and so this graphic we love, it comes from uh, an evaluator named Mark Kabaj, and he shared a recent synthesis of what we know so far about evaluating systems change. And um, what, where he landed, and we tend to agree, is that the field is somewhere on this graphic between diverge and emerge. So folks are thinking about different ways to evaluate these um, complex interventions, but we are uh, still very far from shared practice, uh, which is an exciting place to be, but we also recognize that it can be a little bit unsettling uh, because it means that we can't share with you a specific way to go about approaching your evaluation of your systems change effort. But what we can offer you are, as Hallie said, a way to start thinking about it. So next slide, Robert. Um, so does it mean that you shouldn't evaluate your systems change effort because it's going to be messy, it's going to be complex? We would say no, absolutely not. Evaluation is a tool and we strongly believe that it can help support your, um, your work. And so in the absence of shared practices, um, what we want to offer is a way to, to think about the evaluation. And we're calling these things guidelines and we've got them roughly broken into three, um, a three-part frame. So adopting learning orientation, uh, you plan and you implement. And so I'll go through each of these and then I'll share an example of how we've used these guidelines in practice. Uh, so in terms of adopting a learning orientation, so we think this is enormously important. Um, and you can do this tactically by making space uh, for ongoing sense making um, and having multiple people in the room, multiple perspectives represented and having, you know, Hallie mentioned this earlier, having space and intentionality around those feedback loops. So you're not just an evaluator doing things uh, 
by yourself and then six months later you share a report you are engaging with folks along the way um, you should use your data collection to test assumptions and so um, we know going in there's a lot of things that we don't know about the work that we're trying to do and bringing some intentionality around um, actually testing those assumptions is really a nice way to continue with that learning uh, orientation. Hallie mentioned this earlier, but the importance of shifting your mindset about what evaluation is, is really important. Um, it's Evaluation in this context will not give you an answer. Uh, it'll help you glean insights. It'll, in many cases, raise even more questions. Um, but to really have a learning orientation, you need to accept the fact that this tool um, is going to raise things and insights, but it um, it won't give you an answer, and it doesn't. The learning doesn't end with the you know presentation of findings. You're still going to be um, going back and thinking through things, and and hopefully developing those those reasoning skills as we we talked about. So once you've got your learning orientation, you've done all the hard work of, of getting folks uh, on board with that, uh, then you plan the evaluation. And one of the things that we like to do is actually build in an intentional planning process. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be years long, it doesn't have to take months, um, but don't shortchange this process because it really helps you uh, use your evaluation resources um, to the best uh, way possible because there's a lot of things that you could be collecting information on there's a million questions that you could be asking yourself and if you take the time to really plan and think about how you'll use the information um, it'll just be a better process for yourself so how to actually do this a few guidelines here um, we think it's really important that your first um, you agree on your strategy and your expected outcomes one of the ways that we do this is through developing a theory of change um, if you're looking for a place to start, there are a lot of resources about how to develop a theory of change. Um, there's a book by Funnel and Rogers that has in the, um, towards the back, a list of global theories of change, which are a really useful place to start to get some ideas of the kinds of things that you might be um, trying to change. Then, you know, we think about, and it's very important to identify a set of stakeholders. So not just who are the important people that you need to share the information with, but who actually has a stake in the, the findings and in the learnings. So don't be afraid to move beyond just you know, leadership or your funders, really think about including the community as a group that has a stake in the evaluation. Um, also really important to, you know, we talk about shifting the system, so it's really important that you understand the system, uh, and you can do this through lots of different ways. Um, you know, we think it's really uh, useful to do a system map. There's lots of different kinds of mapping. Um, you can also review documents, look at media, look at literature related to the work that you're trying to do, um, talk with people, understand those structural things that are in place. There's a lot of work um, that needs to happen and a lot of understanding that needs to happen before you even dive in with your own data collection. And there's a tremendous amount of information out there to help, help you do that. Um, also really important to understand the, you know, we say context matters. So cultural, social, economic, historical. Um, do this by looking at media, again, talking with people who are living in the community, um, really getting your hands sort of dirty to understand what is going on in the in the place and we say community it could be geographic it could be related to a particular group of folks um, that you're that you're working with uh, so then once you've got a good understanding of the system so you've got your theory of change you've got a system map um, it's really important to develop then a set of questions that are really going to help you guide the inquiry uh, and as I said, this will likely be a funneling process. You'll probably have a lot of questions that are of interest to you and other people. And so there's going to be a process where you think about what are the ones that are most important to our decision making? What are the ones that are most important to our understanding of the system and our understanding of the work? And so ways to start with developing those questions, as Hallie shared, we've used in the past the inverted triangle, so those various aspects of 
of systems, you know, asking questions about um, the policies, changes, the practices, the resource flows, power dynamics, relationships. Those are really great questions to ask when you're evaluating a systems change effort. Also, consider thinking about aspects of complexity. So again, the context, um, how, where's energy in the system? What are the emerging patterns? Uh, and finally, the as different aspects of equity, I think are incredibly important to raise uh, in the evaluation questions that'll ground your inquiry. So thinking about who are the people who are disproportionately affected, why, what are those structural barriers that are holding those challenges in place, um, and how might they need to start to shift, or how, how are they shifting to, to change those, those outcomes. So once you've got this plan, so you've got this learning orientation, you've got this beautiful plan that in the back of your mind, you know will change because systems are adapting, so so will you. Um, you then implement. And, you know, Hallie shared some of the differences between um, program evaluation and systems change evaluation. And there is a lot of it that is the same. And certainly in a program evaluation, there is an implementation stage. But I think some of the things that we think are really important as you're implementing a systems change evaluation, um, and, and this might be you if you're an evaluator or an someone embedded in an organization or a foundation. Uh, it might be that you are the person who is working with an external evaluator. Um, so the person who is actually out there collecting the data, gathering the information, uh, synthesizing it, some of the things to keep in mind while doing that. So we talked a little bit about methods. Um, they should be appropriate. They should give you information, help you answer the questions that you have. And so certainly surveys, interviews, focus groups can be used. There's also a lot of other methods out there that are really useful for gathering perspectives. Um, uh, they're aimed to be participatory. Some of them are aimed to actually engage the folks in some of the analysis. Uh, so things like appreciative inquiry, outcome harvesting, ripple effects mapping, reflective practice, journey mapping, um, a lot of really neat data collection methods out there uh, that you should explore using uh, if you're doing a systems change effort. And as you're developing these tools, an additional step um, that a lot of folks have been talking about in the um, with the equitable evaluation initiative is thinking about how you develop those tools. So not just thinking about who your sample is and who you'll hear from, but how do you engage with people when you are in development of say that interview guide or that survey or um, thinking about uh, creating a, a protocol for a reflective practice session. So you'll wanna get, you know, the theme here is multiple perspectives at, at every level. So from design and creation to how you're getting the sample to then how you're thinking about making uh, sense of the, the information that you have. Um, we also talk about this idea that you know you zoom in when you're actually implementing, you're in a constant process of zooming in and zooming out uh, as you're looking at the system. And so you might zoom in and look at particular organizations or pieces of the system, right? This is where your system app comes in really handy because um, you've already mapped the system. So you might zoom in on a particular aspect of it. And then you wanna step back and see if there are things that are common across. Are there any patterns that are raising up that are across the system. Um, and so that's a really useful thing to be doing throughout the evaluation. Uh, and it can also help you start to see some unintended effects um, as you're doing that. Um, another nice way to be able to do that is using uh, open-ended or qualitative data collection. Um, if you are only asking about certain things in a closed-ended way, you are necessarily going to miss things that you did not foresee. And so we think it's really important to have some aspect of mixed methods or, or qualitative data, open-ended data collection in there. You know, and finally, we know that systems are dynamic, right? They are always changing. It's the beauty of them, and it's also the thing that makes them really challenging to try and shift. Um, and so you need to attend to these changes, the changes in the perspectives that are represented, uh, changes in the narratives, changes in the energy in the system, you need to attend to all of those to be able to tell an accurate story of how the system is changing or adapting. 
So a few takeaway thoughts before I share the example. Um, if you haven't taken this away already, there is no one right way to evaluate systems change, uh, but it does require a mindset shift toward learning, um, toward new data collection methods, toward a broader perspective. Um, you know, you have to accept that the evaluation will not result in a definitive answer to any of your questions, uh, but you will gain deep, deeper insight about what it takes to bring about change. Um, we think that you definitely should use the findings to inform your decisions, but the, the findings will not make the decisions for you. Um, evaluation is a tool, uh, and so you still need to do the hard work of making decisions, but uh, thankfully, it is a tool that brings you information, credible information to help you um, make those decisions. It's important to be okay with the this fact that findings show contribution, not attribution. You know, if you remember the image that Hallie shared where the arrows are going everywhere, it is really, really challenging. Some would argue impossible to establish causality in a system, but you can understand how your work is contributing. Um, and so even though you might not know definitively that X leads to Y, you know, that's okay. You'll have a sense of, well, sort of our bucket of stuff that we're doing. Here's what was going well. Here's what was maybe, here were our challenges and here's what happened or here's how this system shifted. And then we'll do the, the work of making those connections and making, you know, reasoning about what that actually means. Uh, and finally, you have to be okay with messiness. Um, systems change is hard work. It's messy. The lack of control, the lack of predictability, uh, the lack of causality is challenging. Um, and so you also will need to find an evaluator who is uh, okay with that messiness, who embraces that messiness as well. All right, so before we move to questions, I'll share a quick example. Uh, it's actually a composite of several projects that I've worked on. Um, but they were all out west, out in the mountain west. And so um, I'll just share how these guidelines showed up in, in uh, our evaluation of a particular initiative. It was a foundation who was working on increasing um, children's health and they funded local collaboratives, um, pretty open-ended funding to say, hey, find, figure out what your community needs to um, better children's health. and um, we think it's useful if you have a focus on systems. So not just looking at, you know, programmatic things like, you know, school lunches uh, and school act or children's activities, but are there ways in which policies need to shift or resources need to change um, or mental models need to shift in your community to really get the long-term gains in children's health that we're looking for? Um, so what did it look like for us to adopt a learning orientation? Uh, you know, I talked earlier about this mindset shift. We worked really hard um, and had a lot of conversations with the board about what this evaluation would look at and what it wouldn't. Um, thankfully, the executive director was um, a public health person and understood that the population level data that were out there um, weren't going to be able to tell the story of success based on the kind of intervention that they were doing. And so we knew we weren't just going to look at that. Uh, and in fact, uh, we knew it was a long-term play. And so trying to look at the trends, we could, you know, those data are out there, but they just weren't going to tell the story of the, the effort. Um, and so we worked with the board and in, in sharing that um, mindset. So saying, we, we are not gonna look at those things, but here is what we are going to look at. Um, there's gonna help tell you to what extent those collaboratives are working well, um, what might be challenges and bring you information to help you support those communities. Uh, and tactically, it meant that we built in uh, time to make sense of the information that we were getting, the data we were collecting with lots of different people, staff, board, the community members. So we had this learning orientation um, and we, we did a planning process. So we had a two month phase where we created a theory of change, really tried to understand what their underlying theory and assumptions were about how funding local collaborative efforts would lead ultimately to children's improved health. Um, so with those theories of change, and um, we got input from staff and board and partners, um, we used the inverted triangle, those conditions of systems change to help us think about um, what are the kinds of things that might be changing. Um, you know, to understand context, we talked with staff, we talked with partners, 
Um, we talked with folks in the community. We looked at the county health rankings and other secondary data to help us better understand the disparities uh, by income level and race. Um, and we also learned uh, and made an, an effort to learn the particular context and experience of the American Indian folks living in the region. Um, we learned about the historical and structural forces that were um, in some ways still very relevant to their daily lives. So the effects of the residential schools, the effects of the chronic disinvestment in their community. Uh, so we heard about that and we you know, heard about the ongoing trauma that they continue to experience. And so had that as, as you know, our background going into the evaluation um, and made sure that we were attending to that throughout the evaluation. And then we implemented. So this was, it's a three-year project and we finished the first year. Um, so we saw multiple perspectives when we collected data. I think one of the things we could have done more of was involve the community. So in the next year, we are looking to incorporate more of those participatory methods that I shared earlier. Um, we looked for patterns within the communities, across the communities, and that really helped bubble up some state level findings. Um, and state level opportunities for, for where the foundation could intervene. Um, we had open-ended questions. We had a semi-structured interview that we used. We had a survey. And one of the neat things we did with the survey was some real-time tabulation uh, when we were with the groups of people in community. Um, so imagine you know, posters with literal dots to, to signify people's responses. But it gave us some real-time data collection to say to the community, hey, what does this mean to you? What is important here? Um, so that we could work with that. And you know, we ended the first year certainly with a lot of insights, a lot more questions about the work. Um, and we're really excited to continue into the second and third year. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Jen, who's been working with ADT to wrangle all your questions. Thank you, Hallie and Joelle. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about and chew on here. And so we have lots of questions coming in. One that I want to start with, we've heard, uh, received from several folks is asking how to address, how do you think about the relationship between evaluating systems change and developmental evaluation? Um, could you speak to that a little bit? I'll start, Joelle, then please. Okay. Uh, Joelle, we, we do a lot of developmental evaluation, so happy to. I think um, developmental evaluation is an approach to evaluation that typically is uh, suited for uh, evaluating innovation, evaluating um, new approaches to the work. Um, it's very much a real-time kind of evaluation where the evaluation team or evaluator is kind of a guide on the side. Think of it as a learning partner. Uh, that is, you know, responsive to uh, information needs as they arise and questions as they arise. Um, so it really is a type of evaluation that um, is highly participatory and collaborative with the, the initiative team. Mm -hmm. And so as a learning partner then, or let me say, in this working in this way is a particularly um, effective way to uh, engage in systems evaluation for a couple of reasons, or systems change evaluation. One, uh, system change evaluation is hard to predict, you know, what the outcomes are, hard to predict um, even how the questions will change over time, hard to predict what's going to work and what's not going to work. So by engaging um, an evaluator using a developmental evaluation approach, um, it allows um, the, the question, the evaluator to actually um, collect data in a more quick, responsive, ongoing way to help um, the initiative team or the program team, whatever it is, understand what's happening um, without waiting six months to a year to get an evaluation report. Um, also because um, developmental evaluation is um, very much focused on learning, it really is um, trying to find, you know, answer questions that are, are critically important at that time. So I think there's the timeliness, it's the no novelty, the um, inability to know what the outcomes are going to be, to be able to predict, predict those outcomes. That developmental evaluation then is, again, that learning partner guide on the side. Um, and it's typically done, you know, anywhere from, for a year, year and a half, sometimes longer. The initiative is still evolving. So like a collective impact initiative is, is really ripe for developmental evaluation because things are always new, being added, tried out, experimented with. And an evaluate, a developmental evaluation is really good at um, helping learn along the way. 
So, Joelle, I'm sure you have something to add to that. It's a great question, though. You know, let's move on to the next question because we oh, have so sorry. many coming in, if you don't mind. Um, okay, sure. Moderator prerogative here. Um, I would love to ask you to talk a little bit about the role of philanthropy in supporting and perhaps at times inhibiting this kind of evaluation. We're hearing, uh, seeing several questions from folks um, asking for your perspective on the extent to which um, foundations or other funders understand what and how to expect evaluation, uh, what, what can it produce in this space, and how can we help funders increase their comfort understanding um, systems change and knowing what to really um, expect as reasonable in systems change work, and by extension, the role of evaluation in systems change work? Great question. Well, I'll go try to go first, Joel, for this time. You're on mute, I think. Uh, I, can you hear her? I can't hear. You're still on mute, Joel. Hallie, why don't you get started and we'll yeah, figure out also, the Okay. <laughs> so I really want to hear Joel. Hopefully, it's going to figure it out. So, um, but there's a bunch of things in there. So, first, I think. Um, Philanthropy has a responsibility uh, to help nonprofits pay for evaluation. Um, that is a pretty strong point of view. It may not be popular in some circles, but I do think um, nonprofit organizations need support for doing any kind of evaluation, but especially systems change evaluation. Um, so I'd love to see philanthropy increase their resources to nonprofits for that. I think in terms of philanthropy and how they understand and approach evaluation this way, I, you know, there's a couple things. One, I think to support a system change evaluation, that's going to be a longer term engagement with an evaluator. So they need to be willing to establish, you know, a learning and evaluation partnership with an evaluation a firm or a person um, so that the, 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 the study, the evaluation can go on over time. So we can actually check or track the shifts and, and those conditions and the outcomes over time. Since we know system changes don't happen so quickly. So, Joelle, are you back? Yeah, I think so. Okay, why don't you pick yeah. up from there? Yeah, I mean, I love that. I think the resources are so important. Um, I think one of the things that philanthropy could do pretty easily is think about what they ask for in terms of grantee reporting. Number one, consider just getting rid of grantee reporting um, if you're not using it. And also um, change the focus on, on metrics, right? Like a lot of times with a grant, they ask folks, for what are the five indicators that you're working toward um, and those are not going to tell the full story of the work that you're doing with the systems change effort and so if you could work you know if a nonprofit or a, an organization can work with the, their program officer to really and I've you know there are people there are foundations who are doing this so I know it is possible you know, really think about what is how can the foundation best support the learning and and the evaluation of the effort and you know from everything that we've said today it's not going to be just those five indicators um it's so much more i would finally i'd add one other thing i think it'd be great for philanthropy funders and nonprofits to have a conversation about what's what's i'm uh, sorry what's reasonable to expect within yeah. the duration of their grant and if it's for if it's a systems change kind of effort, then what would be milestones or markers or indicators of of, of success in terms of contribution and movement? Um, I, I think that's a negotiated conversation that would be really rich and, and wonderful to have. Yeah, great. Thanks, Hallie and Joelle. Uh, a couple of questions here, um, just quickly about some of the resources you mentioned. So I just wanted to say that in the chat box we have put a link to a guide. Uh, with many systems tools in it. Joelle mentioned several in her talk and we got lots of people saying, wait, you rattled that list off so fast. So there's a link to a guide here. Uh, thank you, Joelle, for mentioning all those super practical tools. And uh, we also had a question, Joelle, you referenced, um, I think something that's in the references about theories of change. Uh -huh. uh, could you repeat that citation for folks? And then I have another question about theories of change. Oh yeah, lots of resources on theories of change. Uh, it's a there's a book called Practical Program Theory, I believe, by Funnel and Rogers. Uh, right. I'm like I might actually have it right here on my desk. While you're looking for it, I'm going to 
uh, posed the, a couple questions, or we've seen a couple of questions about theories of change. Um, mm -hmm. In synthesis, folks are wondering, some people have heard that theories of change can actually be somewhat constraining in developing a systems change approach or evaluation. Do you have thoughts on how to approach theories of change to avoid the pitfalls that they can sometimes pose? Yes. <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead, Noel. I'll follow up. So, like any, uh, so like so much of the evaluation, theories of change are a tool, and they can be used well and they can be used not well. And I think for a lot of folks, they've experienced theories of change being used not well, um, where there is this mental model that there is a correct theory of change and you're locked into it. Um, that is not how we use theories of change. I think theories of change are most useful when you use them as a tool to articulate your theory or sort of your, depending on where you're at with your program development, your best guess at how change is going to happen. And from an evaluation perspective, they're really important because we wanna know what are those outcomes that you think are gonna happen so that we can help you get some information on those. So it's not about getting it right, it's about capturing your thinking at a moment in time, and then you can use that, um, and then you gather information on that, and then you come back to it and say, has this changed our understanding of how we think change happens? Hallie, what do you think? So I would, I, I agree with you, of course, um, but I, a couple other things to consider is one, again, as Joel said, it's a tool, and I think the greatest value around the theory of change, and again, not, not a logic, model and not a log frame with all the arrows and little boxes, but a simple theory of change, uh, which may have boxes and, and a couple arrows, but it's, it's much higher level, is that it's, a, it's about strategy. And it, a theory of change, when well facilitated and designed, can really facilitate deep conversations about strategy. And what we often find out that a lot of times program staff have not had a lot of time to articulate or make explicit their assumptions around the strategy and alignment around the strategy. So a, a theory of change um, process can really, really unpack all that and get agreement and consensus on what they're trying to do and what those outcomes look like. But I think from a systems change perspective, the challenge we have had as evaluators um, and others who are using theories of change is that they are linear because we live in that dimensional kind of world. They're on paper, right? They're a visual representation that typically says, if we do this, uh, or if this is the problem and we do this, then we'll get this. And that is kind of, you know, communicating that linearity and that causality when we know in a systems change world, that's not really how change happens. So I think there's a challenge between the, the graphic representation of what we're really trying to do with that strategy. So in our work, you know, sometimes we do those linear ones, but we also contextualize it within, all, we understand all the context in there and we name it. Um, but the other thing is that we try to use circles and other representations. Um, instead of just kind of a linear set of boxes, uh, a lot of circles to show relationships and, and connections and influences um, around the work that's embedded in that theory of change. So we, we're, we're still figuring that out. But I think we need to be a little bit more creative too. Yeah, great, thanks. So how do you think about communicating the results of the systems change evaluation? It seems that a standard report may be inadequate or insufficient for capturing complexity here. Mm -hmm. I'm all in favor of psychodrama. <laughs> Actually, that, that is a communication tool that some in the evaluation field have used maybe many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, do, well, do you want to take that first? I mean, I think it's about understanding your audience and then sharing the story in a way that's going to be relevant to them. And so one report, you know, that is really long and has your methodology will be probably read with enthusiasm by other evaluators, but I have learned that that is not always the most useful for you know the board for the community members right and so oftentimes it involves you know certainly one report that that has everything but then other ways you know other snippets of of ways to share it out but also it's not just a one way share out i think especially with systems change so much of it is about how do you set up the conversations to talk about what this all means um, right and I mean, the other is, you know, um, if you've engaged the community and it, you have used participatory processes, there may be ways of sharing findings collaboratively um, mm -hmm. that, you know, people in the community are also sharing what they've learned uh, from the findings. So many different methods from, you know, learning briefs to 
um, you know, executive summaries to, um, you know, creative presentations. Um, you, I've even seen scripted presentations for community members where people play a role in acting out the findings. There are a lot of creative ways to do that. Um, so that was an interesting question. Great. So um, not surprisingly, we're getting a lot of uh, interest in how you evaluate actual specific components of the inv inverted pyramid. So how do you evaluate shifts in mental models? How do you evaluate power? Um, and I know that this is a big, big topic, but I'm wondering if you could just share a few reflections or even pr point people to some resources that they might be able to go deeper on some of those uh, topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can share how we thought about it in the example that I shared. I mean, because first of all, the answer is generally, it depends, and it depends on on how you think power is shifting in the community, how you think it might need to shift, what are the mental models at play. And so for the work that we did on, on childhood health, um, you know, we looked at um, some uh, research from the Frameworks Institute who had had um, shared some, it wasn't specific to the state we were working in, but some overarching mental models related to health and children's health. So things like the idea of uh, individuality, um, fatalism, right? Like there's not much you can do. And so, you know, knowing that those were likely where a lot of folks were were starting in terms of community members, um, we asked about the extent to which those things shifted. And so how you actually do it could be a really intensive thing. If you want to devote a lot of your resources to it, you could hire a specific, you know, you could do public polling, you could do that. Um, if that is one of the things that you really want to devote a lot of resources to, you could also just ask people, uh, you know, get a group of folks together, ask them what they're seeing, how they're seeing this show up. Um, and then same thing with power. So we looked at particular aspects of power. Um, one of the things we were really interested in was the degree to which uh, the community voice, sort of broadly speaking, was represented by the folks who were making decisions. So uh, had a lot of inquiry around it, you know, so not just looking at the number of people and the percentage, you know, the demographic breakdown of the community, uh, the this community group that was making decisions, certainly that was important, but also then thinking about are the, the voices and the wishes and, and the desires of the community more broadly being talked about in the group, so. I don't know if we have any more time. I, yeah, I would just add, you know, men, you, we, like for mental models, I've used drawings, having people draw something. Um, I did this a lot when I was in the, working on organizational learning. I would tell people, ask people, draw a picture of what your organization looks like now and then draw a picture of what you think it would look like as a learning organization. And that really surfaced the mental models about what they thought learning was all about within their organization. So we can use drawings, and then I think we can obviously use interviews, but we, the interviews, the questions we ask are different than the standard kind of interview guide. What do you think about this or that? You, you can use metaphors um, in, through your interviews. Um, you can use hypotheses, um, assumptions. So, just have to think about what we're trying to learn from, you know, mental model, especially, um, and ask a question that will help people kind of think through, oh, ladders of inference, how I come to know what I know. So there are a lot of different ways to do that. Um, so I know we're almost out of time here. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, um, I just want to thank you both. We had, uh, and thank you to the audience for all of the questions that have come in. Hopefully we've been able to address um, some of your incoming questions and we really do hope to uh, continue this conversation. So uh, we are gonna look for other ways to engage on this topic with the field given the, the interest here. So um, please do join me in thanking Joelle and Hallie for all the preparation and your insights today. We're really, really grateful for your time. Lots of kudos coming in through the chat box, so thank you. Um, I just wanna share a few thoughts in closing. So as a reminder, there is a appendix to the presentation when you download it or access it um, later from your email that has a list of resources, some of which we shared in the chat box. And there are several additional ones. There's actually three pages of uh, resources for you. And uh, stay tuned for a copy of the recording in your email um, as well later today or tomorrow. And we will welcome your feedback through a post-webinar survey. So let's just go to the last slide here. 
Uh, for those of you who are looking for an in-person learning experience, uh, the Collective Impact Forum team is hosting our annual convening in Minneapolis this May. Uh, Joelle will be joining us for a session, and we have wonderful content from across the field of people doing uh, systems change work in place using Collective Impact and other approaches to cross-sector collaboration. So we welcome you to join us and would love to see you there. And with that, I just want to say thank you again for joining us and wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.